We're starting the myomectomy here, correct? We are starting the myomectomy here. Excellent. And I'm just getting forced in. She's a very petite patient. So you can see here that I'm just beneath the falcon form ligament to get myself some room. I'm using a long 150 uh, millimeter Excel trocar so that I have a, a lot of neck to work with because we're going to sign doc. We did a uh, we did a right upper quadrant entry and I actually placed my, my accessory port 5 millimeter up there in the right upper quadrant. We're going to go ahead and place the robot trocars now so we can uh, I so that we can actually uh, uh, get the fourth arm in here. She's very petite, so it's going to be a little tight, I think, with her, but I think we can make it work. Got the uterus pushed in. <coughs> All right, let me have the knife, please. Hi, I'm Go ahead, <coughs> This, this is Rupina Saga from uh, Henry Ford in Detroit. Could you give us a little yeah, clinical sure. background for the patient, please? Uh, Indications yeah, in history and the size of the fibroids? Hi, I'm Pretty. I'm Dr. Neetma. Is she hooked up? Can you guys hook her up, guys? Hello? We hear her just fine. Okay. Go ahead. She's going to give you the history while I keep working and putting the fourth one here. Mic is on. The mic on? Yes, we hear you. You're able to hear us, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, uh, she's a 36 years old lady. Right. Uh, she's presented with on and off menorrhagia. And she's a paramount living her with previous history of one cesarean delivery. And on examination, the uterus is around 14 weeks pregnant uterus size. And ultrasound findings are, there is a large 70 to 6 centimeters myoma in the left spinal region. Fingers or feelers? Let me have a tripod. Can you show me this? Alright, so I'm doing a left-sided docking here. We're using the blunt operators, which uh, are actually a pain to put in at times because they just young women with good healthy fashion, it's very hard to get these things to go through. Once I get the port in, we'll actually try to show you with the external camera here our configuration for a mild magnumine. We are about three finger breadths above the umbilicus, which is her, actually is uh, just beneath the fountain form, but she's so petite. Uh, Ar Arnie, the audience has a request here. They want the camera, the external camera to focus on the abdomen while you're talking so they can actually see you placing the ports. I know you said you'd show the ports after all of them have been placed, but there's a request from here. To focus on the do we, do we Do we have a camera that we can show? Okay. Well, we're just about finished putting them in, actually, so um, by the time he gets the camera, I think we're going to be done. <laughs> Can you show them the configuration? Okay, let's take this here. What we have here is here's the umbilicus right here. Can you see it? Can you guys see this over there in the uh, Yes, yes, that's right. You can see that. We have a good view now. We got the umbilicus here. I'm about three finger breadths above the umbilicus with the camera port to compensate for the large uterus and for the fact that we'll be telescoping a myoma out towards us. Her symphysis is right about here, she's had a prior C-section. Symphysis is here. So you see she's very petite because her xiphoid is right about here. So she doesn't have a lot of epigastrium. Her lateral ports are roughly in line with the level of the umbilicus. And then I've got an accessory. And I've got then a, uh, what, it, what you see here is a, uh, what, what's going to be one of our operative arms. This will end up being arm one, arm two, arm three. What I'm going to do, because I already have an idea of how big this myoma is, is I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and preload my VLOX. Can I have a, a needle driver with the, with a VLOX? Into the abdomen, and I'm going to park these in the gutter. The reason I do that is we have a 5 millimeter accessory, and this allows me to go ahead and preload before we dock my sutures. 
so I can get away with using the smallest accessory port. I'll pull out the two needles when I'm finished with them at the end of the case when we morselate the tumor out. That's a classic M-shaped configuration from a guy who spent a decade at University of Michigan. That's exactly right, just like an M. Did he put the secondary ports without visualizing the blind? Arnie, did, everybody yeah. wants to make sure that you uh, put all the secondary ports with visualization. Can they see the secondary port? Can you see them? So no, when you introduced them, did you have a camera inside the end? Oh, yes, we do. We do. We have a camera inside when we put the secondary ports. It's all done under direct visualization. So I'm going to put this in here. First, and I'm going to need another one. Give me one more. So I, I anticipate we'll need about two running V-lock barb sutures to close the, uh, the defect. So I'm preloading again. And again, a reason for doing that is I have a five millimeter accessory. You can't drop these needles in through the five without bending them, and I don't like to bend them. Uh, so we'll, we'll drop them ahead of time. This is a time saver because then when it comes time to sew, all my team has to do is an instrument guided exchange, and uh, I'm ready to go. I don't have to worry. We pull the needles out, the two at the end of the case. So we're ready to dock at this point, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. We have a manipulator in the uterus. And that way we can have some ability to keep the uterus controlled during the time that we are uh, doing the enucleation. Let's go ahead and clear the way here so we can side dock. We'll be side docking, so you may want to show that um, and bring the camera over to the side. Uh, we'll have to, we're going to have to side dock roughly the same way we did with the first two cases. She's petite, so I kiss the corner at 45 degrees like we did before right here. I think that'll work. Side docking. You have? Now, is the barb suture. It's made by Covidian. <coughs> it's just like Quill, except it's unidirectional. Let's, uh, is this sterile up here? No? Nope? Okay. Can we move this, uh, light? Great, perfect. I just don't want to run into it. Okay, okay let's go ahead and bring her in. Okay. Cut it hard. Yeah, keep cut it hard. Cut, 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 cut. Yep. Keep turning it. Keep turning. Keep turning. Keep turning. Just like that. That's perfect. Okay, stop. Stop. Okay, go ahead and bring it on in. Straight. Just let me set the arms up here so we don't run into the thighs. Okay, go ahead, keep bringing it, keep bringing it in. Keep coming in. Straight, straight, straight. Keep pushing. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Okay, can they focus on, on the good. floor so that you know oh, where the, the feet of the robot are? Stop, stop, stop. Compared to, okay. relative to the guy? Come, come back a little bit. Just back up a little bit. That's great. Uh, are, can, can you show the floor? Stop. So we see the feet of the robot bring relative it. to the bed. Bring it in again, guys. Okay. That's good. Great. Perfect. All right. What did, um, I didn't hear what that person said, so it just was, it didn't come through in the mic. Can you guys? Dr. Sanger was requesting that uh, a view of the feet of the patient card relative to the bed could be shown, so people get an idea oh, of the orientation of the can patient card to the bed. Show this? Does that help? You guys got that view? We got it. Okay. Let's show them this, how we do the docking, okay? So this one needs to come out first. All right. So there's a lot of different ways to do side docking. Uh, one of the key things is that you want to make sure that you have the wings uh, open and you've got the good drape management. Otherwise, it's hard to get the the, the the ports in place. Once you get the ports in place, we squeeze from the front and then lock it in the back. You want to maintain your pitch as well as the yaw, and you want to create a window, as you can see here, for the assistant who's holding the uterine manipulator, right? So we can make subtle adjustments here to bring this out. Arnie, Hopefully we didn't pull the choke car out too far, but we'll take a look when we get in there to make sure we didn't back it out too far. She's very skinny. Arnie, what kind of uterine manipulator were you using? Are you using? 
we're, we're using uh, a, the Advincula Arch, which is a uterine manipulator that I designed with Cooper Surgical. Uh, it's just a simple metal arc. Um, we actually have one on the side table. We can show it to them. Do you have the extra one? Can we have the extra one that's in the table, please? The metal, manip metal manipulator? So we just docked the camera. We're going to go ahead and bring in arm two. You can see that here. This is arm two. Again, we're going to fold this arm inward so that we can gain some maneuverability here. And then the last arm to bring in is arm three. Uh, Arnie, do you use your fourth arm on the side of which you uh, side dock? If you're docking Pardon on me? the left side, do you use your fourth arm on the left side? Yes, we're using the fourth arm on the left patient's left side, because that's uh, left sided dock. Generally, that's right. what people do, the side that you side dock on, you bring your fourth arm on the other So you can, you can, whatever side that you side dock on, if you side dock on the right, that's where your additional operative arm is going to go. That's, that's the rule of thumb for side docking. So let me have the, the robot camera, because I need to see if we uh, accidentally pulled the port out. Can have scope? This is the, uh, this is the uterine manipulator that we're using. We put a, uh, a tip on the end of it that's custom fitted to the size of the uterus, and it, it's just a metal. Um, you have a tip? Oh yeah, let's get a tip here. Show them that. Take a tip. Here's an example of a tip that we would normally put on the end of it, and I think we use this very tip actually in this patient. This actually has channels on the side where we can tuck this, uh, tubing. And of course, this could be combined with a co-ring for hysterectomy. Right. So this is this by itself is an advincular arch with a roomy tip. And then if you're going to do a hysterectomy, this is what we call a backloadable coefficient that latches on here like this. And then it locks onto a loading zone up here. And I just need to make sure that. This is con cor connected correctly here, the tubing, that is. There we go. You can see back loads like this, and then you put it into the uterus, and the cup stays out, and then once it's in, you advance this. It so it locks into place, and now you've got this manipulator that's a rigid metal manipulator that's arced with a copotomizer on the end. It's got a pneumocluter balloon right here and then you can do your hysterectomy. So very simple uh, to use. We used it on the first two hysterectomies today. Uh, in this particular case, we're actually just using it without the copotomizer since we just want to control the uterus. So that's what you see here. So we're going to put this off the field because we don't need that. All right, can I have the scope, please? You need to load this up? Get that under. There is a box of those in Mumbai. We just need to attach an adapter here. Just hold on one second. <laughs> We're going to make sure our one port is announced. I think it has to be uh, slipped out. But you can see she's quite tiny, but if you put the ports uh, correctly, they'll be spaced reasonably far enough apart that you get at least a hand's breadth between them, so you minimize your risk of collision. All right, we'll take the camera. Just the PK plug. Okay. And if you guys could open up that tenaculum, we'll need the tenaculum on this particular case. Robotic tenaculum, yes. We would like to have a distant look of the dog robot. We're going to put the tenaculum in this case in arm three, which is in the left lower quadrant. Give me a PK. Is this a zero degree or 30 degree? This is a, this is a zero degree scope. I typically use a zero de degree scope probably almost 100% of the time, unless I'm really struggling to see something. All right, we'll take the monopolar scissor on the other side. I'm going to step in front of you here. This is the PK we were talking about. 
We're just getting our uh, here. Arnie, did you get the vasopressin or pitocin into the fibroid injected yet? What was that? Pitocin or vasopressin into the fibroid before you do the myomectomy? What was the question? We're going to put, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. We haven't done that yet because we just got docked. We'll be doing that here in a second. All right, we're just getting our instruments all in view. Great. Okay, so what I normally do is have the bedside assistant inject with vasopressin. What you'll need to do is we don't need to have the uterus all the way in like this. We actually need it to be up, but just kind of held in the pelvis on more in the lower side, right? Just so that we don't have it so close to the camera, but anaplex. So this is going to be great just like that. All right. I think we're pretty much good to go here. We'll introduce the vasopressin to the anterior abdominal wall with, with the spinal needle. I'll inject it, and then uh, we'll be ready to uh, get it to rock and roll. So. What's your recipe What's for your dilution? I typically utilize 20 units and 50 cc's of saline. So uh, we have a 40 unit vial here, so it's, it's diluted in 100 cc's. As you know, there's no real magic to the dilution. You just have to choose your own surgical preference. And be careful not to have it intravascular so that you don't end up with cardiogenic shock. I've had that happen once in my career, and I really would rather not have that happen again, because that's always a very disconcerting feeling when you see that happen in a patient. I'm going to go ahead and situate the synaculum here. That's it. I need to tilt the uterus. The uterus needs to be rotated. Can you rotate the uterus for me? Just like that. Yeah, there you go. I need it rotated up. That way, because I think we have a short spinal needle for one thing, so I need to be able to... I need you to keep the uterus up like this for a second until we get it in, um, with some vasopressin. I've just got a couple other little little fibroids in here. The fibroid here we can deal with at the uh, in the broad ligament there. Now the thing is we have to decide what's the best direction to make this incision, whether we choose to do a vertical or whether we make a modified horizontal incision. Uh, the reason being that it's important to make the decision because even with the robot, um, it is difficult with the robot to sew with a vertical incision because you can see already that I've maxed out the rotation of the endo wrist. So it's going to be preferable for me to try to figure out a way to do this without making a um, necessarily a uh, vertical incision if I can if I can avoid it the horizontal would be nice however looking at this it looks like I, it might make more sense to make a vertical incision only so that I can avoid getting into the cornua here which is where I don't want to be now go ahead and drop the uterus back down into the pelvis like just like that that actually helps a lot just helps me figure out the best orientation for pulling this out I think this is going to be it right here. Okay. You can see it's a pretty large myoma, makes up most of the fundus of the uterus, so I think we're going to have to go in this orientation here. That's another separate fibroid there. Go ahead and elevate the uterus again so I can just make sure. Normally I get an MRI on patients, but uh, in this particular case I don't have the luxury of an MRI, so I just want to make sure I don't choose wisely my, uh, choose poorly my incision here. So I'm trying to see what's going to allow me to sew this up the fastest. Okay, I think this will be good. Okay, go ahead and uh, bring in the vasopressin, please. Yeah, that's pretty good. And slide it on in. key is to get it just in the myometrium surrounding the fibroid. Okay. Excellent. Um, how many cc's is that? No, I mean, how many did you inject? Just do one to two cc's at a time. 
Okay, just do about two two per site. Okay, go ahead and uh, okay. Inject after you withdraw back. Good. Okay. So we can get some. Go ahead and pull it back a little bit so we can get it up here. Okay, one to two cc's after you pull back. They put a little bit more. Great. Okay. I'm mostly concerned to just make sure I have enough uh, blanching at the site where I plan the hysterotomy. Go ahead and um, bring the needle in, please. Okay, that's not in anywhere. There's no need to dilute it too much. Because injecting better dilute the Push it in a little bit. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and inject. All right, great. Good. All right. Let's see, I'm going to massage this into place here and see if it... Uh... Can you guys turn on the PK? Um, it's a PK hook. It's not. It's not running right now. So I need the, the PK, please. I have no juice. Is it plugged? I plugged it in, I believe. I think it's malfunctioning again because when we had the power outage, I think it, it, it may have shut the PK off. Can you guys turn on and off the gyrus? Yeah, I have no juice. You can go ahead and take the needle out. I think we've got enough vasopressin in here. Is it booting up? I see we get reasonable blanching now, which is good. So I'm going to avoid a horse, but I'd love to do a All right, I'm going to go ahead and make a vertical hysterotomy here. Let me just get the suction ready. Arnie, what are your settings for your water polar and are you using cut or co well, but I cut almost to the point where I cut into the fibroid a little bit, just so that I can figure out exactly where the where the where the correct cleavage plane is. Because to me, that's probably the most important part of a myomectomy, is getting down to the proper cleavage plane and making sure that you have the uterus nice and nice and steady. And I won't grab it until. Arnie, what are your power settings on your uh, monopolar scissors, and are you using cut or coag? Uh, in this one, we're using, uh, I'm using actually uh, coag, but when you actually, when you arc to the tissue like this and barely touch it with the scissor, it acts almost like cut, as you can see. And I'm staying away from the cornua here. And what is the setting is, on your monopolar? Uh, I usually like it at about 30. So, so the, the, I mean the, the monopolar is set at 30, 30 cut, 30 coag, okay, for the monopolar. And it, but I usually run it on coag, particularly because we're using the F system. There is no cut mode on here. Um, it, it's just a coag mode. So that's what I'm using right now is just a pure coag. But if you arc to the tissue, it really allows you to be able to make it look like it's in a cut mode. As you can see here, I'm just delineating roughly uh, where the dissection plane is so that I can have a good idea of when I start to pull on this myoma, which I think I can actually start to do right now. Now, one of the mo more difficult my myomectomies to do is actually these slightly anteriorly located ones. And the reason I say that is because you end up with not a lot of room to pull the myoma out, as you can see here, you know. 
uh, because we're, we don't have a lot of anterior abdominal wall space to work with. I'm already pretty close to the anterior abdominal wall. So I'm going to continue to kind of try to bivalve this a little bit more. Fortunately, she's going to end up with a slightly larger incision. Part of my issue here with her, too, is she's so darn little that um, it's like working with a, it's a pleasure to work with somebody little, but at times it actually works against you when you do robotic surgery. Because I don't have a lot of abdominal wall real estate to work with here. <coughs> So I'm going to do slowly try to work on where is the best way to hold this. A lot of it is just fixation and then gradual delineation of where. Oh, he's bringing that arm in like this. And that's how he keeps it out of the way. You know, gradual delineation of where, where your dissection plane is. And I'm going to try to get away with as small a defect as possible here. So I usually cheat a little bit and I wait and see, you know, if this is going to come out through a much smaller incision like this one here. Arnie, I just made the observation to the audience how endo wristed that tenaculum is. You've got it at a 90 degree angle to facilitate your retraction. Right. And the reason I do that too is it creates space for me here, you know. If I don't have it wristed like that, then I don't have space to work. Because again, you know, she doesn't have a lot of room, um, but what I'm going to try to do here is see if I can make this easy on myself. Can you do me a favor and try to pull the uterus into the vagina more, into the pelvis? Like, let it, let it come in as if you're trying to deliver, deliver it out. Okay, great. That gives me a little bit more working space here, as you can see when she pulls it downward like that. See if I can again delineate the plane correctly here. Again, I don't want to take myoma that is not supposed to be removed. Uh, not myoma, but I don't want to take myometrium that's not supposed to be removed. That's sort of sorry, I misspoke there. There we go. The difference with robotic myomectomy compared to conventional laparoscopy is that with conventional laparoscopy you do a lot of muscling out the, the fibroid like as if you're corking, um, taking the cork out of a wine bottle. But with, uh, with, with robotic myomectomy, particularly when you're not using the dual console and you're by yourself, what happens is you end up basically holding the myoma and then tracking against the, the static tenaculum. I mean, that's basically what we're doing here, is we're holding the myoma and we're working against a very static tenaculum, right? That's what we're trying to do. And the, the one thing I've learned through the years of doing myomectomy with the robot is that you have to have patience because it will eventually come out. You don't want to rip it out of the defect because then you end up chasing bleeders the whole time. So you can see this is going to eventually give. It just needs a little bit of TLC to get it to come. So I'm gradually presenting more and more of the myoma to myself, constantly angulating it. You can see it's a pretty good sized one. Constantly milking it. So I'm constantly milking it really slowly. Pull up. Again, always, always, as you can see, I'm always pulling at a right angle. Right? And I'm slowly just kind of, if you get into the right plane, and I'm a little bit inefficient, I apologize for sometimes a little bit of the inefficiency of my movements because the problem is that, um, one is I'm so used to using an SI, I'll be honest with you, which is really very streamlined in terms of how you clutch between your fourth arm or quote unquote third operative arm and your, and your second operative arm. But um, in this case, we, and the, on the S, uh, the S system here, we don't have the cable to integrate the uh, bipolar with the, uh, with the Da Vinci. So I'm actually having to take my feet outside of the, uh, of, of the console in order to find 
my pedal. So that actually is a, a creates for an inefficiency when you have to do that. Because you get used to muscle memory of where you put your feet when you do these cases. Slowly, we're going to just milk this out. You can see it's starting to give, and as it gets to the part where we're almost having a nucleated, that's when you really have to tell yourself you don't want to pull too hard. Because what happens when you pull too hard is then you, know, you get impatient and you rip it out, and then you start chasing yourself, or you, you, or you inadvertently get into the cavity when you don't really want to get into the cavity. So this is why you have to be very, very careful at this point and have a little bit of patience. So when I get towards the bottom like this, I start to really just take my time. Can you suction in here? Right up in here? Yeah, great. Thank you. You can see I, I, I use very little, um, very little electrocoagulate, you know, electrosurgery if I can avoid it because the whole idea is you don't want your, your uh, defect to look like a piece of burnt charcoal, which unfortunately I see a lot of myomectomies and that's what it looks like. And, that's not a good good way to have it at the end because I can't imagine that that's going to heal very well when it looks like charcoal like that. Good suction in here. Great, 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 good. And I'm just slowly peeling. Okay. This is a good sized myoma. She's definitely going to feel a heck of a lot better when this is all done. Doing some big myomas today. So I'm just hugging the fibroid. Again, you can see here where uh, the beauty of the articulation is the value that this brings to a myomectomy. It's Ten years ago, this is one of the first applications I really found value was to do the myomectomy uh, with the robot because it really, at the end of the day, you have so much control over the denucleation process. It's really uh, Wonderful. If you forget that he's using the robot assisted myomectomy, his process Pardon is the me? same as abdominal surgery. I'm just making a comment to the audience. And I, I, I'm not sure what she said. Um, okay. Somebody can, can. What I said was even though you're using the robot assisted myomectomy, if they forget that you're using the robot, it is the same process that you do abdominal open myomectomy. The process. Yeah, it's the same tech. It's the yeah. same technique. You know, we're we're doing the same technique like we do open surgery. We're not. We're not. Um, you know, the goal is to not. Uh, is to not create a new procedure. Uh, I'm replicating the open technique. In fact, I, I'm probably better than the open technique because you know what would have happened by now with the open technique. Somebody would have reached their big hand in there and they would have ripped this fibroid right out and then it would have been bleeding so much. But instead, you know, we take our time removing it, and then and then you end up with a much better outcome. So you can see, not too long of a time, we basically got the myoma completely inucleated, and that's a pretty good one. I'd say that's the keeper. I don't think we're throwing, you know, I, don't, I think we'll uh, we'll be taking that out. What I'm going to do now is a lot of times what helps is to actually take the myoma. <coughs> And if you can lift the uterus up a little bit, we'll tuck it in the posterior cul-de-sac, and that'll actually help prop the uterus up. Arnie, it looks like you, you could still uh, do a horizontal closure, perhaps, with that defect. Uh, possible. Can you can you lift the uterus up a little bit? That's good, right there. That's good. That's good. Just like that. Actually, I think I'll be able to close this with it somewhat vertical. Should close pretty good uh, this way. Um, now what I need to have done is, can you, and you know, I didn't take a lot of ex, um, extra out here because this is the way the uterus is unfortunately shaped. Can I, um, can I get the scissor changed out for the mega driver, please? I need the mega needle driver. And as you can see, efficiency-wise, I've got my suture already, so I'm ready to roll. I'm going to take one of them with me here.
This is one right here. So I'm good to go. And the second one is back here. So no need to bring needles in. This is all going to stop oozing. Can you guys put the mega needle driver in, please? Thank you. Mega driver. Doing slider F3. Okay. So I'm going to use a running barb here in this case. At this point, we don't really need a tenaculum too much. Just going to sit there out of the way. Can you suction just in here briefly for me? This is, I hate to say it, but this is really just overall an ugly looking uterus. Put <laughs> in su suction in here. Can I have suction please? Okay. Are there, are there other fibroids anteriorly? Yes, there are. There's one right here. See? Right here. This is one right here. I'm going to have to open up the peritoneum to enucleate this one right here. So we'll address that as soon as we're finished. I'm going to get a full thickness bike here. Arnie, we were talking earlier about the grasping characteristics of the PK and the issues with it, and here you're suturing with it. Any comments about that? Yeah, I hate the PK for grasping. Um, I prefer long tip forceps. They don't have it. Um, Pro-grasp would be a little bit too aggressive, and the um, penetrated bipolar is also probably not the best at grasping. Uh, but in order to save money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically um, make myself use the PK. It's suboptimal. I don't normally use it, but I'm trying to save money here, so. Arnie, why do you feel progress is uh, too much, too aggressive? Well, well, um, progress. What, 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 I'm sorry, what was what, the question, guys? Why is the progress too aggressive, in your opinion? Well, it's just a fat, it's a fat instrument. I don't want to crush the tissue, you know? I, I, I'm just a big stickler about uh, a lot of what we do. By the way, notice that with this V-lock, if you've never seen it before, it has an eyelet on the end. Once you take your first bite, you, you have to thread the eyelet like I did here. And then instead of pulling it through, I automatically go ahead and take the next bite. And then I pull it through. And this allows me to save a step. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you could use the progress. I, I just think it's a little bit aggressive at times uh, in terms of it might crush tissue too much. And I think we have to always think about surgical principle and to not do that to the tissue that we're working with. So I try to avoid things that are, are traumatic uh, and use the appropriate instrument for the procedure. So, you know, it's just like open surgery. You wouldn't use something like a heavy body forceps or anything like that on the muscle necessarily. So. All right, that's the first anchored stitch. This is a 12-inch barb suture. It's 180 days. I uh, I actually like to use the the 2-0 on the on the myometrium. I actually use it all the way through full thickness, and uh, I don't worry about it being on the serosa. There's been a nice study that came out recently, a sheet model study that looked at the use of barb suture. Good suction in here. The other thing you have to remember too as we're doing this is that's the endometrial cavity right here. I don't want to take too aggressive of a bite and sew my manipulator into my defect, which uh, is easy to do if you're not paying attention. So you want to make sure that as you get your bites, you get good bites, but you're not sewing uh, your manipulator into the incision. But that, so uh, to get back to that, that study I was talking about, they did a sheep study. They compared um, quill, which is another type of barbed suture, with uh, with, with traditional Vicryl, and they found that there is no difference in blinded reviewers in this longitudinal survival study. They took sheep, made two incisions, closed one with a barb, and the other one was closed with Vicryl. 
survived the sheep and then sacrificed them several months later and they blinded the reviewers. And they, there's no difference in the rate of adhesion formation between the two sutures, the two sutures used. So really at the end of the day, it's, um, it, you know, it's not what you would think because notice that as you close defects with barbed suture, as it tensions correctly, the tissue actually evaginates around, around it. So then you end up with a nice closure. I'm trying to orient my camera in a way that makes it seem as if this is a horizontal incision, even though it's not, just to make it easier for me to do the closure. And I'm actually running it, and I'm bringing it out just beneath the serosal edge, so that it'll almost kiss the serosal edges, or at least bring them together without a lot of tension. Dr. Adhan, this is Dr. Kavita from, I mean, Kim's Hospital. Uh, Dr. Adnan? Yes, yes. Uh, does this uh, transverse or vertical incision, does it make any difference in the future ruptures or rupture of uh, I think in a myomectomy, I, I, you know, I, I can't say whether it's necessarily, well, you know, we talk about that with C-sections and classicals. You know, I, I, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to know, to be honest with you. I don't think that it'll necessarily make her at any greater risk than what would be the baseline risk for a rupture. I think a lot of what happens in myomectomy with our concern with rupture is probably too much too much use of, of, uh, of electrosurgery, you know, where you end up with a defect that's black. Okay. That's not going to come together. You know, notice this is all nice and healthy tissue. Yeah. It's nice and pink. It's not overly bleeding. It's closing very nicely. The suture, the suturing is well-placed sutures, which I think is very, very important to have. And, um, you know, I think that this will heal fine. Uh, is she at risk for rupture? Absolutely. It's about one to two percent, you know, one to two percent in the literature for myomectomy. So transverse or vertical maybe, incision doesn't make any maybe, difference. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's a little bit higher with the fact that we did make a somewhat vertical incision, but at the same time it was necessary in her particular case to do so. This is where it, it, it's a little tricky as you, you get down. That's what I mean by you gotta do some creative bites when you're when you're closing barb suture, when you're sewing actually vertically, whether it's barb suture or traditional suture. Because you you you're matched out at the wrist in this orientation, so I do a lot of backhanding. So vertical incision is uh, easier to suture, is it so? Or, uh, no 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 no. It's a much harder it's a much harder incision to close, just like it is in traditional laparoscopy. Yeah. It's just the robot gives you a little bit more freedom of movement, okay. but there still are some challenges when you go vertical. You know, so you have to you have to factor all that in. What if endometrium gets open? Do we suture it or uh, leave it? No, no, no. Suture it. You suture don't want to leave that open. With which material? Suture material do you advise? I use a vicral suture, like a 3 vicral, bring the endometrium together. Okay. And then uh, once we're done with that uh, closure, then we close it like we normally would. I mean, the closure is no different than if you had a problem when you were in an open case, right? In an open case, you would fix it. Then you fix the same way in a, uh, in a laparoscopic case. I want to make sure I don't take too aggressive of a bite here because I'm near the tube. We so don't want to compromise the tube here. So I'm staying away from the tubal origin. Staying only in the muscle here. And I think that... Uh, Now, what I'm going to do is sew back on myself now and double back. And double back and do the next layer, which is going to be a full thickness bite to close the next layer. So, we're going to come out here. And I want to be cognizant of where that tube is located. Don't want to compromise it. We're, we're pretty far from it, right here. Look, may look close, but from a laparoscopic perspective, it 
with a robot it's actually not not as close as you would think, but they were going to be very careful. Now we're going to start on that second layer. <coughs> Bigger, you try. Can we put the put our camera port up to up to epigastrium? I mean, for hysterectomy is also either hysterectomy or myomectomy. Can we go up to epigastrium port as in lap lap coli? What was the question? <coughs> camera port can we can we take it up to the level of epigastrium in bigger uterine? Either for hysterectomy or myomectomy. Can we take it up to where? Epigastrium, I mean, can we place yeah, yeah. it near epigastrium also? Oh, yes, you, you can. Uh, it also depends on the patient's body habitus, you know. So these ports are basically, these are super umbilical port placement for her. Yeah, no. And, 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 and yes, you can take it up to that level. It just depends on that individual patient, you know, what it looks like. And in that case, when, where will be our operating ports? <laughs> you. I didn't hear the question. Guys, where will be our operating ports in uh, when we put our camera port at uh, epigastrium? It's, well, these are in, her ports are in the epigastrium. This patient is all in the epigastrium her ports. There's nothing that's low in her. So, our operating ports will be at the same position as uh, like, uh, with any other uh, normal size, uh, not normal size, this size you like, right? My mectomy. I mean to no, say, no, no. I mean to say, does our operating ports change with the uh, with the size of the <laughs> camera ports and size of the uterus also? You go, absolutely. Everything is adjusted based on the individual patient okay. and the size of the pathology. Yeah, yeah. Right. Can you drop the uterus a little more retroverted? Mm -hmm. There we go. That's good. Perfect. Uh, Arnie, I know you said that, you, that you're dealing with a petite woman and most Indian women are petite and we have our bigger ladies which gives us a luxury of more real estate as you said. But I think you, you got a little lucky today because if you had the petite woman with a wide broad uterus, that, that would have been uh, a double whammy. So to have a uterus that's elongated versus broad, that's always easier. You want that uterus versus a broad uterus. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good when you deal with certain patients. And so, yes, we we, uh, we may have had a petite patient, but the uterine uh, uh, shape was uh, good for us, you know. She has a little bit of redundant, you know, redundancy in the, in the um, serosa and the muscle here, but I don't like to trim that because the uterus will remodel over the next couple of months. And this way we don't end up taking good functional muscle here. I'm just going uh, full thickness. This is now full thickness of uh, serosa and muscle. And you can see that there's not a lot of barb exposed because when you tension it appropriately, the tissue will evaginate around the bar of the suture, as you can see that here. We actually, at the rate we're going, it's a good possibility this 12-inch V-lock might make it all the way across the defect here. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we have another V-lock in here if we need to start it. And we'll definitely do that. But uh, so far, Are you going to use ba uh, baseball stitches on the serosa or are you just use continuously? You know, I used to do baseball stitches a long time ago when I sewed with Vicryl and Monocryl and it looks aesthetically pretty. At the end of the day, I don't know if it makes a heck of a lot of difference. So I stopped doing it all because it's just a time sucker. It, it just, you know, I don't think it adds any additional value. Uh, whether I did a baseball stitch or not, I always put an adhesion barrier down. So. I just don't know whether or not that's really, uh, you know, adding to the procedure. I mean, it looks nice. You can do a baseball stitch with barb suture. My fellows, for example, they like to close the, the uh, often close the serosa with a bar with a running baseball with a bar. But that's fine. I don't see anything wrong with that. But. What kind of adhesion barrier do you use? I use either an uh, inner seed 
um, which is off-label in laparoscopy, or I make a slurry solution out of seprafil, which is a, a methyl cellulose sheet, um, and we use that. Uh, depends on whatever floats our boat for the day, you know, we just kind of, um, you know, change it up from day to day. Can you suction in here, please? So you can see in a relatively short amount of time, we can enucleate the biggest fibroid and then close it. I normally, if there's a bunch of fibroids to remove, I don't like to keep removing all the fibroids and then close it at the end. I like to fix each defect as I, as I go along. Uh, because that way you don't end up with this oozing during the surgery, you know, so. <clears throat> well, we actually, I didn't think we'd be able to do it, but we're, we, we may get away with one, one suture for a two-layer closure here. Which is a surprising... Um, I thought the defect was a little bit bigger than that, but I guess not as much as I thought. And then we'll, once we get this closed, we'll address that fibroid in the broad ligament. Dr. Anna, is it mandatory that yeah. we use a barrier? I'm doubling back now that I've gotten my corner so I can I can lock this. Artie, the discussion in here was on the relative necessity of adhesion barrier with myomectomy. In other words, oh. how necessary do you see it in the global perspective of things for a myomectomy per se? I, I, I think it's necessary because, I mean, this, this patient's going to need to deliver by C-section. Of course, she's already had a C-section, but she, she, she's had one C-section already, but I would recommend that she deliver by C-section. Uh, and so, who wants to go in there and have the potential of adhesions? Because even under laparoscopic conditions, the rate of adhesion formation is about 40%. It's 98 with, tradi with traditional laparotomy. Um, can somebody come in with a scissor and just cut this flush right here? Okay, so we have that done. Uh, do you, do you avoid the suture cut when you are running suture? Uh, you know, I, I typically try not to use the suture cut. Um, I mean, if I'm not, you know, doing a live case and talking and distracted, I'll use the suture cut. But in cases where I've got a lot going on at the same time and I could get distracted and cut my suture off by accident, I'll use the mega. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good point you bring up is that if you're not comfortable with running suture, don't use the suture cut. Otherwise, you're going to get frustrated and cut your suture by accident. Can somebody come in with a scissor and cut this right here, please? We've seen it happen too often at our place, so when we're running, it's always the mega without the suture cut. Right. Although right. sometimes we like to call the suture cut the suture gnaw, and sometimes it doesn't cut all that much. Kind of flush? Yep, right there. Perfect cut. Cut the cirrhosis a little bit there. It looks like the cirrhosis is bleeding right here. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just, we'll leave this needle and we'll pull it out at the end when we morselate. All I do is, I keep inventory and we will just pack this, pack it in the peritoneum here in the gutter. And then just leave it right there. Come back for that in the case.
Uh, don't, yeah, you can get the inner seed ready, but we don't need it yet. Uh, we'll put suction out, if you don't mind. Get this clot out of here, just because uh, any little bit of blood in the pelvis eats up the light so that way we don't make a dark field. Can you suction all the clots? Go ahead and suction. No irrigation, just suction only. Keep going. A little bit more, just underneath. Okay. Go ahead and let the uterus dip backwards posteriorly. Good. I will need a scissor, please, where the needle driver is. I'm running out of space. So, um, can you drive the uterus a little bit more close here than here? It's amazing how these are always the tip of the iceberg as you get into them. Absolutely. See that? I think it's interesting about broad liquid myomas is often there's not a lot of there's not a lot of defect to fix when you're done. The key is to figure out where it's specifically attached. That's really the main issue here. Just trying to understand where this where this guy is uh, hooked up. I think the key also to get the maximum brain mobility is to keep your arms in neutral position and constantly clutch as you see Arnie's arms were in neutral position. That gives them more range of motion too. Now, there are times where you can see that I'm going to run into a collision here eventually, so I'm going to um, try to, I'm either going to be able to correct the collision internally or I have to switch the orientation of the arms so that I, I can pull this thing out. So we'll see how this goes. Okay, just take it to rip it to where, where this is attached, where it's not in view, and then you're just really bitter about it because then you can't see where the bleeding's coming from, and then you end up chasing after your tail. Fireboy. There we go. Went low. 
think it's much bigger than I would have thought. Very deceiving. Good thing you have to be careful of you, it's only where the bladder is. Times where you don't realize how close the bladder actually is and you get into it. How do you care that like you would anything else? challenges in training and teaching is the very issue you just mentioned. You're in a situation right now where a lot of clutching is necessary so that your excursions of the instrumentation are uh, achievable. Exactly. To me that's, that's something that takes only the way that you learn to do that. Is un, uh, unfortunately there's no replacement for that except for time. But that's where I think that the simulator will really come in handy because you can practice on different types of, of exercises that help you build on that skill so that you can be efficient with doing the procedure based on the based on the question. Arnie, I watched Michael Pitter do one just like this, and he went posteriorly and opened up and uh, transected the uterine as well. Would that, that ever be something you'd consider doing? And if I couldn't approach it anteriorly, I would, but it looked like it was much more uh, easier to access from an anterior location than it was posteriorly. Uh, so I typically, uh, and I will choose the route of the least resistance, and so this for me is the route of least resistance, so I chose this approach. As you can see, it, 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 was, uh, it was a good one to choose because we were able to get the myoma out a little bit easier this way. And have control of it, a little bit better control of it this way. Just some attachments along the myoma here. Do you think at all in any terms of the strategy of putting uh, thrombin in the defect because of all of the uh, small vessels and veins that may be in there? Um, you could if, you're, if you were concerned that, that you didn't um, get hemostatic enough. Uh, I think that um, when we're done here we'll get a good idea of what, what it's going to look like. And then we can decide whether or not we would benefit from that. I'm just trying to figure out where. I'm getting to where, where it's attached to the uterus, and I need to figure out where I need to cleave this off at some point. Um, can you suction in here? This is a little bit vascular right here. And sometimes in situations like this, it's always better to leave a little bit of a... Uh, A little bit of, of, uh, of sometimes myoma on the uterus. Yeah, uh, I, 
on the bed itself than to try to get greedy and think you're going to take everything and then pop it in. Nice round of applause for me this day, Arnie. Question from the floor whether you would change to an angled scope at this point. Uh, not really, because I uh, I can see what I need to, to see in here. Can I suction some more in here? Suction more gently. Good. Here I go. Come back out. The nice thing is we didn't make a defect in the posterior broad ligament. Now, if we had a hole in here, then we'd have to repair that because there's a risk of herniation of bowel. Uh, but, you know, with this, you can make the argument, do we reclose this with some, with like a, some suture, or do we just let it be and let it repair neolize? Because once we get the manipulator out of here, that's just going to sit like that, right? This way you don't get a hematoma either if you get a little bit of oozing. Let's go ahead and irrigate in here. <coughs> Irrigation. Irrigation, please. Kept the round ligament intact, which is always good. But I do like your point. You know, if you're concerned, if you do have some bleeding, and I have done this before, it sounds like you have too, David. Is a is it is a good place that you can put prop in. You can put flow seal or tip seal, surgeon cell, anything if you're concerned that you might have a little bit of ooze afterwards. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, I think that what we can do is do a low pressure check. Can we drop the pressure to less than eight? <laughs> Suction the fluid out to less than eight, please. Looking pretty, pretty. Uh, what's the pressure now? Eight, seven. Looks good. She's going to clot that off. I would leave that be. Not now. Uh, enemy of good is better. So stop, you know, mucking around in there. You don't want to coagulate. You don't want to get too aggressive and then get a ureter. Um, this is just a little bit of, uh, you know, that's the cirrhosis. It's starting, it's got a little bit of fluid in there, but that's okay. That's all, that's all closed off. It's going to be hemostatic. I think we're good. What we'll do now is, uh, let me see this here. Let's see if this is another myoma here. It might be another fibroid, actually. Can you move the uterus? Ask a question. 
Then the fact that we're going to double check this. Tell us why an MRI can't fall. Yeah, when you have doubt, you can always look with the MRI. Have you been using the um, intra-abdominal ultrasound probe from Aloka with the tile probe? I have not, because I always get an MRI, so I've never really had a need for it, because I, I, I can localize everything with the MRI. I think this is a, um, a myoma here, so we're going to have to address that while we're here. So go ahead and retroflex the uterus for me. Retroflex the uterus. Can you, can you stop tilting it upward and let it retroflex? Yeah. Yep, another fibroid. <laughs> It's a good case you guys picked. You got a little bit of everything. <laughs> Making me work, work for my uh, work for my meal. I just want to say the people here in uh, Hyderabad have been fantastic today. You had a great day in the OR. Um, I think it's a testament to the team that you know we did two hysterectomies by lunchtime, basically, and uh, doing an 18 week myomectomy and, and got it done uh, pretty efficiently. Uh, I mean, 18 week hysterectomy got it done pretty efficiently. So, kudos to the team here. Such muscle memory, I keep wanting to push the pedals on the inside. And uh, no, I can't do that. Yeah, it's an act is probably one of the most scary instruments on the robot platform. If, uh, if you're not aware where it's at at all times, it's got such a wide jaw opening that. Uh, I'm not sure where it's at. You can get into a world of trouble quickly. She had a small subserosal posteriorly. I'm sure you noticed that. Do you bother with those? I don't. If there's not really any major issue with that, I leave them alone. Again, I just think the enemy of good is better. If it's not a problem. I leave it alone. It's pretty small. No need to put an incision there unnecessarily and have her uterus stick to the bowel. You're not tempted to do like a myolysis type of uh, process on it? Uh, you know, if it looks like it's easy to do, but then again, that also creates adhesions, right? So. Suction in there. There's a major vessel right there. I think that's something that might have been feeding the myoma. And this is very superficial, this one. That's going to have a lot to close. Thank you. 
So Arnie, you've, you've given us a fantastic demonstration of dissection of fibroids in a variety of different settings in this one uterus, and uh, as we're uh, appreciatively uh, leaving you from Hyderabad, uh, could you uh, kind of sum up what we learned from this case uh, uh, as you're uh, sort of finishing up here? Well, basically, uh, the, you know, the main thing is proper port placement is important um, because if you have good port placement, then you're going to be able to have good reach of all the myomas in the uterus. And as you can see, the uterus is looking pretty, pretty normal appearing now. So good port placement. Uh, the tenaculum is absolutely a fantastic tool for doing myomectomy. We can really, without it, um, you can't do a robotic myomectomy. Um, we have a couple and questions. We have a couple questions too, Arnie, if I may. Okay. That broad ligament fibroid that you no. remove now that raw area, are you going to suture it up or are you going to stuff it up with surgery cell or how do you handle that? If we think it's oozing, we can put some surgery cell in there. Right now we have a little bit of bleeding from this site, which I'm going to put some sutures in right here, and we'll sew this up and get that to stop bleeding. But it just, this looked dry earlier, so we probably won't put anything in there necessarily. But what I'm going to do now is if I can get the, um, if I can get the, the needle driver for the scissor, I've got another piece of V-lock in here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, close that defect up with a running bar. Any other questions? Can you guys get that change this up for me, please? Any other questions? Well, Arnie, we're going to uh, take our leave uh, of you, and we're very appreciative. Thank you for a wonderful demonstration. No problem. Thank you very much.